home. The incessantly repetitive oppressions of daily life had been especially trying to young Jenny this morning. The ignominious rooster had long ago crowed his gregarious soliloquy. Jenny had heard it plain enough. There was no ignoring his idyllic poetry. She raised her disheveled head and banged against the wall at her father's headboard. He replied in a straining, muffled groan, Morning, signifying that he too had hearkened to the voice of another day. But with that semi-conscious acknowledgement, progress had slowed to a complete halt. Jenny snoozed again, and so did Mr. Stanhill, until the bright, iridescent glow of the morning summoned even the most recalcitrant soul. In the ensuing moments, her father arose, stumbled to the washstand, splashed his face, and initiated the process of dressing, a process more scrambled than the eggs he was soon to be distractedly cooking. Jenny, a precocious, ingenuous 12-year-old who preferred outside chores to inside work, slid out from under her nocturnal abode into the cool, invigorating air, quickly sliding a crumpled pair of overalls on her cotton underclothes and punching into a red plaid flannel shirt. She marched out to the kitchen door, bounced off the back porch, and attacked her appointed morning rounds. She stomped blindly towards the cluttered barnyard and initiated her familiar ritual. She spread grain for the chickens and gruel for the geese. Gathering her intestinal fortitude, she tethered Prince the goat and humbly offered the intemperate Oriamnus a bucket of water, a bucket he invariably ignored with a consistent vigilance that perturbed our young heroine to no end. She offered it each morning only as a stubborn, stubborn tribute, acknowledging their mutual obstinacies. Her ritualistic greeting complete, she placed the bucket in an accessible location and proceeded to the barn where Beatrice the cow, Aunt B, pressingly awaited her attentions. Returning with a pail of fresh milk, Jenny paused briefly at the garden to admire the neatly hoed rows and assess the progress of her agricultural efforts. This was her second garden since the death of her mother from the typhoid epidemic of 1910. For Jenny, the grim remembrance of earlier, happier days seemed to gnaw at any developing interest or enthusiasm for gardening, in spite of her desire to continue her mother's horticultural efforts. Watching the tiny seedlings stretch out from their earthly grave was an all too painful reminder of a plot of ground in the Baptist cemetery that would see many moons before it manifest a similar metamorphosis. metamorphosis. Turning her attentions earthbound, she gently caressed a deep scratch on her bare forearm, which pointed up the difficulties with which all the above activities had been achieved. During the brief span of time required to complete her morning obligations, she had managed to rip a two-inch gap in the side of her shirt, catching it on a split board in the chicken house, a board she had meant to hammer down last week. She let Prince butt a substantial portion of his drinking water onto her leather school shoes, freshly cleaned the night before, but now sopping wet beneath the barnyard fence, where they had been inadvertently left overnight. She forgot to feed Beatrice, and returning to accomplish this objective, scratched her arm on the thorny locust tree as she swung the yard gate closed. Naturally, the weather-washed lumber rebounded into her stomach, knocking one of her dangling ribbons out and into a puddle of mud. Meanwhile, the back, back on the porch, a brood of assorted yard cats, seizing the initiative, savored milk from the unattended bucket left precipitously close to the steps. Fortunately, they left enough to provide for the Stanhill's breakfast needs. After pausing momentarily in the damson orchard to comfort Duchess, an aged black Labrador, who was much disgruntled by the feline misbehavior, Jenny sauntered clumsily to the house for her morning meal.
Her father, glancing a resentful eye on his pocket watch as he handed Ginny a plate of very scrambled eggs, quoted absent-mindedly, Time waits for no man. The despondency of the pronouncement irritated Jenny, who was still reeling from her break-of-day burdens. Good Lord, she snapped, stop your dawdling and get moving. Aye, if children be the heritage of the Lord, then the fruit of thy womb is a bit on the tart and testy side, her father observed. Woe, woe is me, the zeal of mine house hath eaten me up. Her reproaches are fallen upon me. Have you forgotten your upbringing, child? He continued. Children, obey thy parents, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. All right, all right, praise the Lord, Jenny sniffled, ruthlessly abusing the pepper shaker. See how happy you are down at the sawmill if you're an hour late and everything's at sixes and sevens and Mr. Fouts is throwing a conniption in the middle of it. So true, my little scarecrow, he, applied, he replied, absently tucking some wayward strands of his wavy brown hair firmly behind each ear. To do and to bear, that, that is the duty of life. I don't suppose you know where I could find a clean pair of socks. 